Welcome to PCTV on the Road. I'm Matthew Tucker, Pittsfield Community Television's Public Access Coordinator, and I'll be your host for today. We have quite the exciting episode of PCTV on the Road, which is going to take a look at the magic of the mountains of Berkshire County and uh, the creatures that might be hiding within and how, what all that has to do with a man and his whale. But I think first I'd better uh, introduce uh, my guest and uh, provide a little bit of background. Um, my guest today is uh, part of the Berkshire Historical Society, and he is Peter Bergman. Peter, thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to be with you, Matt. Thanks for coming to Arrowhead. And we have had a fantastic time um, doing a number of shows for our PCTV On the Road uh, production series. And I'm excited to be talking about all of the stuff that's going on with Arrowhead. But I think what might be good to give people a little bit of background as to um, what this amazing thing that's next to us here might be and what that has to do with Melville, we might want to start with the house. Why not? I think that's a great idea. Uh, the house was built in the late 1780s. Um, it had two owners before Melville bought it in 1850 and moved in here in October. He used the farm. It was 160 acres when he purchased it. Wow. Um, when he left here 13 years later, it was a house, other buildings, and only about 44 acres. Oh, wow. So he had okay. to sell off a lot of land just to live and survive here. Jeez. You know, he was a very famous author when he got here. Okay. He'd had two m massive runaway bestsellers, Taipei and Omu. Mm. And the first book he published after he moved here was a book that now is an American classic called Moby Dick, but at the time was a classic American failure. It was the biggest flop in publishing history. Really? It really was. Wow. Kind of scary when you think about it. People didn't get it. They just didn't understand it. Really? Mm-hmm. And it, it's, I suppose it's interesting from the historical 2020 perspective that we have now to be able to see that what at the time was a flop is now considered, what, the third most important book in, in the a, 19th century? In a recent survey, the third most important book written in English in the 19th century, the first two Number two, right above Moby Dick, is yeah. uh, James Fenimore Cooper's The Last of the Mohicans. Okay. Uh, which I think is a terrific book, but I yeah. don't think it's better than Moby Dick. <laughs> and number one, and remember, this is books written in the 19th century in English, is the Bible. Okay. Which I had no idea was such a recent construction. <laughs> so... Through the, uh, the magic of television, we have the ability to take a little tour of the house and nice. look around and uh, show folks at home uh, a taste of what they could see if they came down uh, and had a tour and hopefully provide a little bit of the uh, reference for the magic that we're going to be talking about for this season. Great. Why don't we for do Arrowhead. that? Yeah. So what is the, the first room that we're looking at here? You're looking at the North Parlor, which was the guest parlor for the Melville family. Um, Mrs. Melville um, wanted it painted pink and green. Hot pink was a brand new color in 1852. All of her friends in Boston had it in their homes. So Melville painted the rooms pink and green. Uh, we've restored it to those colors for many, many years. It was just a sort of plain sort of white and gray. But that, she loved it, and she loved it so much that her father actually had special wallpaper design for their bedroom. Really? And when we go up there, hopefully you'll get a look at the pink and green wallpaper. That is a fantastic color. I mean, even from a modern point of view, it's a, a bold color choice for a room. A lot of our visitors don't understand it. So it's one of the things we do talk about on the tour. Um, the house is decorated with actual furniture and furnishings from this neighborhood in the 1850s and 60s. Wow. That, that actually belonged to Mark Twain. Really? Yeah, it's for holding your music scores. Oh, okay. And he was, it's one of about six pieces he left in the Berkshires. So one writer 
leaves a deposit in the home of another writer. I'll be darned. Yeah, it's kind of lovely. They had a grand piano, not a spinet, when they yeah. lived here. The couch was a part of Lizzie Shaw Melville's dowry. So it was here in Melville's time. It's a grand couch. It's wide. But really, it only holds two women because of the design of the dresses of the period. OK. I can sort of imagine, in my mind's eye, those voluminous dresses and that you couldn't, exactly. you couldn't fit too much more than. And you just got a glimpse of a portrait that we talk about on the tour, a woman who was very important to Melville and his family, who owned what is now the Country Club of Pittsfield. That's Sarah Morwood. OK. Wow. Yeah, there's a new biography of her called Melville in Love, which gives you a hint about their friendship. I'll be dying. At least in the book. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we think it was probably true. We're not really sure. <laughs> uh, the staircase is not original to the house. It was a replacement for one that made it almost impossible to open the front door. Oh. So this was put in in the 1930s. Um, it's wonderful. We have a photograph of the original staircase on the wall, it went the other direction. Okay. And was a lot steeper. That mirror that you see in the photograph, we still have. It's in the north parlor. Oh, nice. And we have stories to tell about it and other furniture. So we suggest that when you take a tour, if we don't talk about it, ask about ask it. Ask about it. The clock that you're looking at is one of our newest acquisitions. It's a replica of the famous clock on the stairs that Longfellow wrote about was in the Appleton House on East Street, wow. where the Pittsfield High School is now. OK. So we're thrilled to have it. It has wonderful stories. Um, the Appletons had a daughter who Longfellow wooed and married, which is why he was here. And when the Appletons left Pittsfield to move out to Boston, they took the clock with them. Mm. We're told that it burned up. Oh. But that clock was made by the Plunkets to sit in the Appleton house where the original clock had been. So it's oh, a replica. Oh, OK. But it's an 1800s replica of a 1700s clock. <laughs> it's one of our newest things, and we love having it. Well, I, I think one of the, the most interesting things about a, a tour of the space, and I've walked around um, Arrowhead with you a couple times, um, we did a tour of the space and then just sort of being in the background. There is so many stories to be told about these walls and the things that are within. We can't tell all the stories on any one tour. Luckily, we have different guides. So if you've been here and seen something and you're curious about something that nobody talked about, mm. take another tour. Because huh. every guide will bring a different perspective and we are hoping and working at re-engaging people, yeah. getting them more involved in their own tour, yeah. which I think is a lot of fun. That's very cool. So far, so good. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, my gosh. We're about to go into Melville's bedroom. That's a fabulous room. I like to call it Grand Central Station because so many people had to walk through it all the time. <laughs> and of course, there was no running water in the house. So. Right. That, what you, what you just saw, was how you washed your hands and face. And beneath it is a little implement used to go to the bathroom, because there were no toilets or bathrooms okay. in the home. So that's the face washing bowl. And on the shelf below is the pooping and peeing bowl. OK. And there were a lot of them in the house. And they had to be carried back and forth to take them outside and dump the contents. Fair enough. Yes. Uh, you didn't want to live with it in the house for too long. I can imagine not. You can get a sense of that wallpaper. Yeah. Um, it's a fabulous pattern called the thistle pattern. OK. It's a Scottish flower. All of the flowers are hand stamped. Wow. So no two are in exactly the same position. OK. So you can imagine the amount of work that went into wallpaper. Jeez. It made it very expensive. and. It's a little hard to tell with your camera, but it is the same pink and the same green as, as down as, here in the, in as the down parlor. In the, that's yeah. fantastic. It's a lovely, graceful room. The floorboards are wide and thick. They're original to the house, so they go back to the 1780s. 
And the bed is a Melville bed. And we have some of Lizzie Melville's personal toiletry items on the dresser to the right of all this. That implement that you're looking at was used to tighten the ropes on the trundle bed where the children slept. Okay. You're maybe familiar with the phrase sleep tight. Yeah. Oh. That's where that comes from. If you didn't tighten those ropes, you ended up sleeping with part of you on the floor. <laughs> Not a comfortable position to wake up in. I can say, I can imagine not. Everything here at the time was heated with wood fire. <clears throat> so it wasn't easy. Here we go. Here's Mrs. Melville's things. Everything you're seeing there except the electric candle belonged to her. Wow. We're very lucky, Matt, to have some of the Melville things here. Yeah. When they left here in 1863, they did what everybody does even now. They packed up their stuff and moved away. Right. And Herman, who had not had much of, of a success as a writer during his time here, didn't say, let's leave a few things for the museum. Because <laughs> there was no hope or thought of ever having a museum for Herman Melville. Right. Yeah, that's on the right is a copy of a letter he wrote to one of his children about the baby Fanny, his youngest of four children. Okay. Three of them born here, in, presumably in that bed. And there, is, there are the kids. Huh. Malcolm, the oldest, the third from the left, was born in New York City. The other three were all born here. Oh, we're going to go out the door and across the hall. Well, I, and I was about to say, I think uh, the tour might be heading towards the room that... Um, and I think one of the things that um, Pittsfield and Berkshire residents um, sometimes experiences there's this sort of oh it's a it's an old house yay it becomes very sort of normalized but this was the room that yes. took my breath away when i walked into it it does that to most people this was herman's study this was where after his morning chores he would retire shut the door and write he wrote moby dick and three more novels at a table just like that pushed wow. up to that window with the view of mount greylock he wrote 17 fabulous short stories and began writing poetry here. Huh. So this is a very important room. It's the largest room on the second floor. His mother wanted it for her bedroom, and Herman said, no, this is mine. <laughs> and you can see Mount that, Greylock. that view, Mount Greylock, from there. And the humps of Mount Greylock, the humps of the whale. Yes, and in fact, our new brochure has a picture that I took of that mountain this winter. It's hard to get a real picture of it with its snow covering. I don't know if wow. you can get this, but if you look carefully, you can see the entire shape of the whale right down to its flipped tail. Good grief. So we were very lucky that I, I could take this picture. It's on our new that's rack fantastic. card. That's fantastic. It is. Uh, it's an, that's what Melville saw through the winter of 1850-51. Right out there to the north was his big white whale. I'll be. So anyway. Well, and, and I think that starts a, a good place to ask a question about, that, that takes us from mountains and, and into magic. What was this? For the Historical Society this year, what is the obsession, other than the obvious one, about Mount Greylock? Mount Greylock, we feel, belongs to us as much as to every resident of Berkshire County because of Melville's obsession with it. Mm. He's part of what we think about and concentrate on here at the Historical Society. Um, he's one of the most important people to ever live here and to maintain that extraordinary view. He fell in love with it as a kid. Yeah. His uncle owned what is now the Country Club of Pittsfield. And okay. he spent part of his summers here with that view. Wow. And he didn't obsess on it when he was young. But from about the age of 30 on, it factored into his mind. Mm. The novel he wrote right after Moby Dick called Pierre, or The Ambiguities, is dedicated 
to Mount Greylock. I think it's the only huh. mountain ever used in the dedication of a major book. Huh. But he would sit out on his porch, his piazza, he liked mm. to call it, and look up at the mountain and think about it. And he began to see dancing lights on the mountain. And he believed they were, they were fairies who had possessed the mountain and created a, a, a life there. Huh. And he said that he could see where the fairies dance, which is what we're calling our season. We're actually concentrating on the fairy images of Mount Greylock. And this is our, our resident fairy, Windrose, <laughs> which is really her first name. I'll be. Windrose Morris. She lives here in the county. Her mother is a very well-respected actress, Mary Andreco. And she, her, her image, not just this one, but two others, will be seen all summer long advertising our wistful look at Mount Greylock and its denizens. So she's very important to us. And this image was taken here in the house, Nice, by the way, uh, in that first room we looked at on the, our little tour at the front okay. of the North yeah. Parlor, through the window. And I'll tell you a secret that we're not telling everybody. Her shoulder ornament right here, this beautiful blue thing, yeah. is actually the window latch. Really? Yes. We couldn't get it out of the picture, so we turned it into an ornament. <laughs> we're very pleased. Shelby Lee Adams took the picture. It's a beautiful picture. And he's picture. extremely talented. We're, yeah. so, we're very grateful to him. But one of the things we're going to be doing um, from mid-August to mid-October is a special display of artist-created fairy houses. So, so that's what is in our wide shot That's what's here. sitting That's what here next between to us. us. The, yes. This is a fairy house. It is. It's called Mesa Verde. It's a New Mexico design. It will be here all summer because we have it now. It was created by two local women who seem to have a ball making these meticulously crafted fairy homes. A woman named Catherine Stocking Coza, who lives in Dalton, and Carol Hall Jordan, who lives here in Pittsfield. And they've dropped off three so far, and we have, I think, seven or eight more coming. And these wow. will be on display in the Red Barn. Nice. Along with our other art displays this year. I'm thrilled with this. I, every time I look at it, I find more and more things. I know the fairies are delighted. Well, I, and I will tell you that sitting next to it, there's the, the camera cannot do this justice. This is something that you want to be able to see up close because even Absolutely. while we've been chatting, while I've been sitting <laughs> here, every once in a while you have that, is that little detail a, you know, whatever, and you're looking at it, and it by goodness it is, and that's, it's yeah. amazing. One of the houses that we already have is called the Moby Dick Lo Lo Lodge. <laughs> they didn't know if they had the right to use Moby Dick, so yeah. they added an extra B. But it's a beautiful, small, much smaller construction. And in the wood itself, in the wood frame, there are three whales. Really? One of them a white whale. I'll be. Yeah, so it's like, come and see it. Have the challenge of trying to find the whale. But it's part of our big summer plans. We have authors coming throughout the whole season. Mm. Um, Ann Elizabeth Barnes, whose new book on the Reverend Samuel Harrison starts our reading series off. Nice. Uh, Paula Kappa, who's written a wonderful mystery novel um, called Greylock, huh. in which a composer who wants to create a symphony on whale songs comes to stay on Greylock, huh. where he is haunted by a demon. Oh my. It's a fabulous book and she'll huh. be with us in June. We have our eight poets who are creating our third volume of new poetry mm. here at the moment. We'll be doing a reading in July. We have the fabulous group of authors who are part of this new Pittsfield project that I'm sure you've all heard about. They're going to be in two buildings here created the, to the Mastheads. The Mastheads Project. And they'll yeah. be doing a reading here at the end of July. And Word by Word is coming here in mid July. Nice. And it goes on like that throughout the season. Goodness. We're also celebrating 61 years of the movie Moby Dick. 
with Gregory Peck. Okay. We'll have a big exhibit in the barn of wonderful things that were actually used to make the movie, including the model for the Pequod. Really? With the model sailors. Huh. So you'll be able to see what the, how the, the long shots were created. Nice. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. And a wonderful man from North County is bringing his Captain Ahab garden gnome here. <laughs> it has an extraordinary story to tell. Oh, yeah? So for the first two weeks in July, he'll be on display, and we're doing a program with Gage where he'll describe his grandfather's history with this garden gnome, which has traveled the world. Really? Yeah. I'll be dying. So we've got the Moby Dick focus, and yeah. we've got the fairies and the mysticism focus. It's going to be a very busy and exciting summer. I should say, I, it's... It sounds both overwhelming and thrilling all in one breath. <laughs> That's our goal. Good. <laughs> we <laughs> like to fantastic. overwhelm and thrill people. <laughs> You'd be amazed the number of foreign <laughs> visitors we get. Absolutely amazed. It's, we are the premier destination for foreign travelers in the Berkshires. Wow. Americans come for theater, for the music at Tanglewood, certainly. Yeah. And a lot of them come here. But for foreign visitors, we seem to be the thing. Really? So if you come here and take a tour, you get to see all the things we've talked about and probably meet a foreigner. I'll be darned. With any luck. Now, in addition to the cultural and artistic and creative things that are happening um, here on the property, uh, I also understand there's land restoration being done as well. There's quite a bit. Right at the moment, we are taking down 74 trees that are dead or in very poor condition that line the big field to the north of us, which we own. It's part of the Melville Arrowhead property. Mm. And revealing Arrowhead to people on the road. We've been kind of obscured. Yeah. And at the same time, we're going to be working two workshops to recreate and rebuild the historic stone wall. Wow. Which I think is going to be lovely. We've done a lot of work to the house in the last couple of years. New roof, new siding, painting. Um, our grounds are beautiful. They are. And we have a fabulous nature trail that goes up into the woods that connects this property to the country club. Nice. We are told by the biographer that that path is where Melville and Sarah Morwood used to meet hmm. in the afternoons and do God knows what. <laughs> Fair enough. But she was a poet, so it was probably intellectual. Probably. Probably. We'll go with that. <laughs> so I think this might be a question that's already been answered based on many of the things um, that you've um, discussed and talked about, um, but is there still an audience for Melville and the sort of things that this property and this space embody? It's an amazingly growing audience. Uh, a lot of people all of my life have said, well, I tried to read Moby Dick, I couldn't do it. <laughs> Just couldn't get through it. That's not as big a case anymore. In fact, Beginning of August, the first week of August, from his birthday on, we're going to be doing a marathon Moby Dick reading here. Wow. We invite everyone to come and take part or come and listen. Melville read aloud is the best way to read Melville. Mm. And I've taught two courses in the last couple of years on Melville's poetry, on his novel Pierre, extremely well attended, and people got into the, ling the language. Melville's language is poetry. So yes, in answer to your question, there's a growing interest and perspective and perception of the work of Herman Melville. And it's, I would say, through uh, some of the things that we both learned here at Arrowhead and uh, some of the things that I saw during one of the productions we did as part of the PCTV on the Road ah. program series. Um, where you were a guest of Woody's for Woody's World. <laughs> yes. Some of the, as a lot of people, myself included, when they think Melville, they think Moby Dick. Sure. But the, some of the poetry that you shared of Melville's was 
unexpected, I think, is how I would describe it. Okay. Because it was beautiful. It is. But I didn't, I didn't expect it. Well, again, if you open a book of Melville poetry and just try to read it, it's hard. Yeah. But as soon as you start to speak it out loud, it begins to resonate to the ear and to make sense. And that, I think, is part of the joy of a great poet. So with our time today drawing to a close, is there anything that you want to share with our audience that we haven't touched upon either about the coming season or about the property or about Melville himself? Well, there is one thing I'd love to share with you and to everybody who's watching. Arrowhead is a great place. My former boss here, Betsy Sherman, says that it is the largest single artifact in the collection of the Berkshire County Historical Society. Hmm. And people get confused about who we are. We are not a building. We are not the Herman Melville Society. We are the Berkshire County Historical Society. Hmm. And Melville and this place are the centerpiece yeah. of who we are, what we do, and what we care about. And that's something people don't quite get. But it's really the truth. We are the historical society for this county. And Melville is right deep in the heart of the core of what we are, what we do, and what we care about. Peter, it has been an absolutely delightful uh, half hour to, to sit with you and talk about Arrowhead and Melville and the things that are going on this year. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, to our audience at home, this has been PCTV on the road. Uh, Pittsfield Community Television is going to be on the road all of this year, 2017. Where we're going next is up to you to find out. Visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Pittsfield TV or search for the hashtag PCTV on the road. Until next time, for all of us here at Pittsfield Community Television, I'm Matthew Tucker.